Hi there, this is Brian Barnett with The Last Symptom. When I started The Last Symptom, I never in a million years imagined it would grow as it has. In these early shows especially, audio quality was often iffy, and there were references to services or online groups that are outdated and no longer in use. Great improvements have been made. Where should you go for all of the most up-to-date resources that I offer? TheLastSymptom.com is my permanent website full of free resources where everything is always up to date and that I encourage you to refer back to often. There are also a few modest paid resources at TheLastSymptom.com. These support my efforts and have allowed The Last Symptom to exist for as long as it has. These include one-on-one phone conversations with me one-on-one Zoom video calls with me, and perhaps most importantly, the Last Symptom Fundamentals course, which is a two-week, intensive, pre-recorded online video course that is far superior to things like DBT. The Last Symptom has a flourishing YouTube and Rumble channel where I publish regular orange slices, which are condensed video insights of five or ten minutes in length. If you're just now discovering the last symptom, welcome. I hope you will find every insight and resource you need here for authentic and permanent recovery from emotional disorders such as borderline personality disorder. Now on to the show. Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental health nor emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he has gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as they individually and personally choose while accepting full responsibility for their own individual thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares And by listening to this program, you are acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Weather outside is frightful, and the fire is so delightful. And since we've no place to go, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Happy Thursday, everybody. This is Brian Barnett. Is it snowing where you're at? As you can probably guess... It's snowing where I'm at, but I love it. I love the snow. You know, as long as it don't stick around until July, I'm okay with it. Uh, I drive a Jeep Wrangler. I just shove her into four-wheel drive, and these are good excuses for me to get out and have some fun, especially since today is my free day. Well, if you're out there in it, I just want to ask you to please be careful, be safe, and uh, try not to get into any trouble, all right? What I'm going to do today, instead of taking the 4x4 out on the back roads to see if I can get stuck, is to share some more details of my personal experience uh, regarding my personal recovery from borderline personality disorder. Two early breakthroughs that I, I'm not kidding you, changed the entire trajectory of my life. I, I was just talking to a fellow the other day, and he said... Uh, Can real change happen in an instant? And I said, it did for me. It did for me. And this experience that I'm going to tell you about today was that moment. It was a moment that I can remember as clear as day, where uh, in one second, I was completely blind to a reality that involved me. And in the very next minute, In the very next second, a wall come crashing down. And I could see something of such enormity that it it continues to be a positive uh, force in my life today. It's, It's hard to explain in a way that communicates the magnitude of relevance that it had for me in my life. With any luck whatsoever, there will be somebody out there listening 
who this story might, might have a similar effect on. Now, I'm not promising anything because everybody's at different stages of receptiveness. There are different stages of what they are ready to hear and um, accept. Different stages of what they are ready to absorb and fully appreciate. So I'm not promising that this is going to you know, fix you of your borderline personality disorder just by listening to this podcast. But what I am saying is that for me, in my personal circumstances, from one second to a next, my, my life changed course. I have never, ever been the same since. I walked in, I sat down, I talked to a man, and when I walked out of there, I was a different person. Now, I still had things to work out. I still had many years left of connecting dots and figuring out how this misconception that I had lived with had affected me throughout my life. And then to live a certain amount of life with this new understanding of things and witnessing how it affected things for the better. So a lot of what I'm going to describe here probably seems like a bunch of big no-brainers to the typical person who's never had to deal with anything similar. But you have to understand that for me, these revelations were enormous. They were nothing short of enormous. Earth-shattering. I had lived a lifetime completely oblivious to my inner wiring. I thought psychology was for the weak. (laughs) I really did. (laughs) I thought psychology was for those looking for an easy way out as opposed to toughening up and charging at life head on. I laugh, you know, I laugh when I come across people who are like that today. And there's so many out there, uh, especially men who have the same attitude I once had. And I just, I feel sorry for them, but uh, I also kind of want to slap them upside the head. You know, I thought psychology was like a parental note. Allowing the weaklings in gym class to get out of playing the hard sports. That, that's, that was my attitude. And part of it was my culture. A lot of it was my dad's influence. He has that perspective on things. And how stupid they are. How stupid they are for, for thinking this way. How dumb I was for thinking this way. Do you know what psycholo- Do you know what therapy is, first of all? Now, a lot of people are going to tell you a lot of different things. But the nuts and bolts of therapy is this. It is learning intimacy with oneself. Boom, that's, that's it. That's the whole entirety of therapy. That's what it is. Learning intimacy with oneself. What is intimacy? Intimacy is getting down to the root of things. For example, you know the things you like and dislike, and you know all these what's. Intimacy with yourself is learning why you like those things, how you came to like those things. Why are your preferences what they are? Why are your dislikes what they are? You know you know what your political ideals are, but why are that, they that way? What influences in your life affected you? And why did those influences affect you? And how did they affect you? So that you came to rest on certain conclusions. All right, this is how the world should work. Intimacy with oneself, it's a beautiful thing. There's nobody on the face of the earth who can't benefit from it. There's nobody on the face of the earth whose life cannot be improved by becoming more intimate with oneself. By knowing oneself deeply, intuitively. The whys, the hows. So, at this point in my life, I was a tough guy. I was a tough guy, and I thought that therapy was for the weak. I can put myself back there and remember exactly, exactly what my perspective of the world was. As you can tell, my perspectives have uh, changed a bit. Now, there's a quote I'd like to read. This is from uh, Dante, the Divine Comedy, Inferno. The quote is this, In the middle of the journey of my life, I found myself in a dark wood, for I had lost the right path. The reason I love this quote so much is because it describes to a T where I was at in my life at that time emotionally and how I felt. 
I had already suffered my hitting rock bottom event. Divorce was all but inevitable. I still had the things in my life that uh, you know made my life at that time my life, but I knew that they were going away. I was going to lose everything. In the middle of the journey of my life, I found myself in a dark wood, for I had lost the right path. Well, it probably won't surprise you then to learn that by far, by far, the most unlikely and difficult milestone of my recovery was when my eyes opened for the first time and I realized for the first time that my thinking, that is some of my fundamental perceptions of reality, of life, were wrong. I don't think people generally understand what a huge deal this was. A fundamental perception or core belief, as they're often called, is something you become certain of in your early childhood from consistent, direct experience, which you then use forever afterwards to inform your approach to life. Gravity is an example. You know, I have the benefit of having a a three-and-a-half-year-old daughter. So not only do I get to apply everything I've ever learned in my recovery to my life, but because so much of my work with borderline personality disorder deals with how we are affected in our early development, in our the early stages of our life, it it just worked out this way. I didn't plan it. I didn't plan it this way, but it just works out that my daughter is growing up through this stage of development that I always talk to you about, and I get to witness it firsthand. I get to witness the things I'm telling you, not only from my personal experience looking back, but now I'm also watching my daughter and getting to see how these concepts are not concepts. This is really what happens in your life and in everybody's life. So back to gravity. Is there any doubt in your mind that gravity will push you down. Some people say it pulls you down, but that's not really what happens. Because of the curvature of the fabric of space-time, what's actually happening is that you're being pushed down. But anyway, is there any doubt in your mind that gravity is going to push you down? Now, let's say I try to convince you otherwise. I say, climb up to the roof of your house, and I tell you, uh, uh, I promise you, Gravity has been a figment of your imagination all your life. So just trust me and now jump off the roof of your house. Would you do it? Could you do it? No, you couldn't. And why not? Because your direct personal experience has told you that gravity is a thing. Now imagine, imagine that you had some experience that caused your eyes to open and realize that gravity was a lie all along. That's what the moment I'm about to describe to you was like for me. But right now I'm telling you that my daughter, by the time she was one and a half, she knew what gravity was. What would happen if she dropped a toy or if she fell off a chair? I remember, I have this beautiful memory of my daughter, me standing on the steps one day. She was two, I think, at the time. And uh, I leapt off maybe the second step of the stairs. And she was fascinated. She was delighted. It was like the greatest thing that she had ever seen anybody do. So what did she want to do? She wanted to do it too. So I allowed her, while I was holding on to her little hand, to get up on the first step. Do you know that at two years old, she could not bring herself to hop off that little tiny one step? Even though I was holding her, she could not bring herself to do it. Why not? Because by two years old, Her direct personal experience had taught her the nature of gravity and what it does and how it behaves and the reality of it in life. What are some other beliefs that we adopt really early in life? Well, sugar's sweet. Fire will burn you. These are things we stopped questioning and we filed them away a long time ago. We filed that sucker away as permanently settled and sealed. No need to get into that file drawer anymore. Do you ever go back and question gravity? No, you don't. Do you ever go back and question whether sugar's sweet? No, you don't. This is what we're talking about when we talk about 
our core beliefs. And with emotional disorders, we have perspectives about our sense of self and identity and value, as well as the value of our feelings and the nature of feelings, what they are, what, why they're there, what they do, that we have long, long filed away when we were two, three, four years old. Now, the two distorted core beliefs that I'm going to be talking about in this uh, episode are not the two foundation core beliefs, which are the singularity of borderline personality disorder. I've talked about those in other episodes. I'll be talking about them more in other episodes. But what I'm going to share with you today, the purpose of it was that it revealed to me that indeed there were things that I were I was fundamentally certain about and wrong about at the same time. That was the purpose of this experience and how it opened my eyes and opened my willingness to search out more information. So think about anything that you're certain about in your bones. You know, uh, take anything. The nature of a sunrise. Now imagine the forces, the breakthrough knowledge, the power of reason that would be required to make you genuinely question if your perception of sunrises has been wrong all along. Boy, did I resist. It took the right person a lot of patience to get through to me. I'll never forget the moment my first breakthrough happened. I was talking to a guy, a psychologist in Scottsdale, Arizona. And uh, we were already into our second week. And the big breakthrough moment came when this therapist sort of offhandedly said, feelings are never good or bad, right or wrong. They just are. Just as it's neither good or bad, right or wrong, that grass is green. Grass just is green. There's nothing good or bad about it. It just is what it is. Now, somebody had probably said something to this effect to me before. I think it was a combination of things that that allowed it to get through to me this time. This time I was worn down. My mind was in the right place. But more than that, it was the way he said it. At the precise moment he said it, it miraculously broke through and landed on me hard. It was like a piece of wall crumbling, and now a single ray of sunlight started streaming through. In that very moment, I realized something for the first time in my life, that for as long as I could remember, I had been judging my feelings as good or bad, right or wrong. Now, I don't mean that I felt bad for memories and thoughts and things like that, but rather I often felt bad for what I felt, as if by feeling a certain feeling that this in itself was committing some terrible secret wrong. And usually these feelings were feelings directed toward my dad, because here he was, a person I I was convinced loved me, who was abusing me at the same time, he was very abusive. And I was feeling these conflicted feelings of love and hate for the way that I was being treated. And these two feelings were terribly conflicting. So what do you feel uh, after you feel hate for somebody you're supposed to love? You feel shame. And it was this circle. It was this cycle going on inside of me for my entire life. And each time I would feel anything negative about my dad, I would hate myself for it. I would hate myself for it. How, How could I do that to my own father? feel that way about my own father. This one thing, the greater implications of it, were simply staggering. I'm not kidding you when I say that I sat there with my mouth agape, staring off into nothing, seeing all this for the very first time. I experienced this flush of realization that this aspect of myself which certainly had tremendous, it had always had tremendous power in defining who I am and how I operated in the world, had been completely hidden to me just a mere second before. If it had been a snake, it would have bit me. (laughs) For all my life, this enormous reality about myself had been completely hidden from me, and yet there it was right under my nose all this time. My mind reeled. Feelings aren't good or bad, right or wrong. Feeling isn't something humans do. It's an experience that we have. If feeling isn't something we do, but an experience that we have, 
then feeling things, no matter what those feelings are, cannot possibly fit into a category of good or bad, right or wrong. Many things can be used to classify me as a good person or a bad person, but my feelings are never a factor in what determines this, no matter what those feelings are. It was like a, a waterfall come crashing down over, over me. You know, it doesn't help that in English, when we talk about feeling, we use it as a verb. He feels, I felt, she will feel. I know that in other languages, some other languages, this isn't the case. Nevertheless, feeling is not an action human beings carry out, such as saying I bought or he drove or she screamed. And see, here's the significant part of this. For every action a person carries out, no matter what that action is, the individual behind that action is inherently responsible for it. Right? Now, I had lived my entire life with the distorted perception that my feelings fit into this category. That feeling was an action that I was responsible for. And with this single strike of a lightning bolt, my eyes were open to this utterly ridiculous, yet powerfully, unbelievably powerful mistake in my perception of reality. As well, as well as to all the broader implications of it. I remember leaving there that day, my mouth still agape, knowing that it was going to take me a long time to totally digest this. To compare it with my life, all the different experiences in my life experience. And to see the reality of it and how I had behaved one way and how I might have behaved another way if I had simply known this truth. I was still digesting this uh, revelation or epiphany. There's really no other way to describe it except for an epiphany about feelings. Two days later, I was full of excitement. And I was eager to interrogate this, this brilliant man who had had the insight to detect where my distortions lay and then to focus me upon them. I realized at this point that this man, this man I was talking to, was my ticket to genuinely learning some practical, life-changing things. I didn't have to wait for very long, because two days later, the next time I sat down with him, he hit me with the next epiphany, and it was enormous. And it's not just that he hit me with any epiphany, but that the epiphany that I, my eyes were open to on the second day complemented so well the first epiphany about feelings. We're going to talk about that next Thursday. And I hate to leave you hanging, but this was such a massive, enormous, uh, life-changing moment in my life. These two days that I sat down with this guy, that my life has never been the same. So I want to give them the proper attention that they're due, each point. I talked about how I experienced this huge revelation that I had been judging my feelings as good or bad, right or wrong, for my entire life, unknowingly. And how that realization was like a waterfall that come washing over me. Days later, I was still digesting this. And I was fascinated at this new thing about myself, which I had been oblivious to. In fact, I was excited. I was really excited that I was finally getting, getting real insights. I was getting real answers and real insights from this fella, this psychologist in Arizona, in Scottsdale. You can imagine that I was, I was really eager to sit down with him again. And I wasn't scheduled with him again. It was an intensive program. So I was seeing, you know, for like eight hours every day for three weeks, I was seeing, well, we had, we had group in the mornings and then I'd see a, uh, one psychologist. I'd spend an hour with her or him. And then I'd go to the next psychologist and then I'd go to the next one. And then in the afternoon, right before lunch, we'd have another group session that lasted about an hour. We'd go to lunch, we'd come back, we'd do the, the hour thing again. Uh, I wasn't scheduled with him for like another two days, but when I finally got to sit down with him again, I was I was very eager to see what more he had to tell me. More aspects of myself, maybe, that had been right there all along, but that I'd been uh, unable to see. And that was when he hit me with the next huge epiphany by bringing up and then explaining the differences between guilt and shame. 
and he did it so simply, so cleanly and so simply. Here's what I primarily learned that day, which was the second profound insight, which has helped me achieve and maintain an emotionally healthy life perspective ever since. The differences between guilt and shame. Guilt says, I did something shitty. And uh, forgive my cursing. I'm simply quoting the way he said it. Because his choice of words had, had an impact on me. Doesn't create the same impact to say, crappy. I'm trying to have the same impact on you that he had on me. Guilt says, I did something shitty. Shame says, I, I am a piece of shit. Do you catch that? Guilt says, I did something shitty. And shame says, I am a piece of shit. Guilt is always healthy. It's always constructive. Shame is never healthy. And it's never constructive. Guilt says, what I did was wrong. I got to do better next time. Shame says, I myself am what is wrong. I'll repeat that. Guilt says, what I did was wrong. Shame says, I myself am what is wrong. Why is that relevant? Well, because if you recognize that what you did was wrong, you can fix that. You can do it differently next time. But if your fundamental belief is that you are what is wrong inherently, there's no fixing that. So shame says, I'm inherently defective. Why even try? No matter what I do, it won't change the fact that I, I am a piece of shit. A piece of shit that does good deeds is still a piece of shit. Do you understand that? If you perceive that you are inherently a piece of shit, you can uh, donate money to the poor. You can save cats out of trees. You can help old ladies cross the street. You can feed the hungry. You're still a piece of shit. <laughs> because you perceive that as your inherent nature. That's shame. Now, up to this point, I had quietly believed, for all my life, I had quietly believed that I lived with guilt, when in reality I was burdened by shame, and shame was destroying me. And to make matters worse, the reason I felt this shame, which I had always mistaken for guilt, was because I was cruelly, irrationally critical of my feelings, which were never good or bad, right or wrong, to begin with. In the last episode, I told you how it wasn't just the fact that I had two epiphanies. It was the fact that he gave me two epiphanies, which so thoroughly explained together that they worked together. These two epiphanies, these two erroneous perceptions I had worked off each other. All of this had been going on inside of me for 35 years, deep in the background of my mind. I was entirely unconscious of these things until right at the moment he spoke to me about them. Then I internally, deliberately took a look at myself in a genuine way for probably the first time ever in my life. And I realized that the principles he was explaining to me were not only fundamental to a healthy approach to life, but that I had carried a distorted understanding of these things for my entire existence. And the truth of it all gushed out at me. What had been completely shrouded from me for 35 years, up to just moments before, was now suddenly and overwhelmingly obvious to me. In his book, uh, You Are Not So Smart, David McRaney says, The spell of highway hypnosis on a long trip is always broken when you take an exit into unfamiliar territory. The same is true in any other part of your life. These two conversations with the psychologist in Arizona proved to be like a major exit for me into unfamiliar territory. And suddenly, I was like a man who had been snapped out of a long dream. These two epiphanies in combination were like taking the Matrix red pill. <laughs> One alone would have given me years of positive, healthy readjustments to make. 
and meditating and thinking over. But the two of them together, in combination, the way they interact and play off each other, cannot be adequately emphasized here in this single episode of a podcast. I've spent nearly uh, 10 years now ruminating over all the ways my subtle misunderstanding of them negatively affected my life and my behaviors, my view of myself, my view of others, and on and on and on. In all areas, these things were connected in some way, had powerfully informed and negatively influenced my life. You see, this breakthrough allowed me to ask, why? Why did I end up with an erroneous understanding of these things to begin with? How did that happen? In turn, this allowed me to trace their origin back to the two utmost fundamental distorted core beliefs that I spoke about in the previous podcast. And once I had done that, I was then able to ask why again and trace their origins to the subtle messages of uh, invalidation in my parents' behaviors when I was a child. It was a snowball progress, beginning with just two small but incredibly, incredibly important tweaks or adjustments to my fundamental understanding of life. Now, armed with an accurate understanding of the subtleties of these two fundamental principles, they continue to serve as powerful influencers for genuine positive emotional health. As you can imagine, I no longer discredit the importance of nuance. Nuance matters. A single subtle adjustment in understanding on something seemingly insignificant can very literally be the wrecking ball that just blasts through that wall separating you from real progress. It can be a defining moment for when you begin to change your entire life in an authentic way. Now, there's still plenty of those in the psychology field who want to debate the concept of shame and uh, argue over what exactly it is. They do this not out of genuine interest in helping you. Rather, they do this for their own benefit. You see, they're getting off on stroking their own sense of intellect. But there's no ambiguity about what shame is or isn't, except for the ambiguity that they themselves create. So leave those people to their stroking and uh, don't allow them to pull you into it with them so the experience i've related here was just the beginning the big breakthrough if you will that led me to many more milestones and epiphanies if it has a positive effect on just one person who is where i once was then it's worth sharing my experiences with you now in the first podcast I asked the question, what would it take? What force would be powerful enough to make you change or question your perception about sunrises? Well, the reason I use that illustration is because of this. It takes eight minutes for sunlight to leave the sun, travel through space, and reach us here on Earth. Did you know that? Eight minutes. What this means is that you have never seen a sunrise or a sunset as it is actually happening. When you sit on the beach and you watch the sun, boop, just peek up over the horizon. That already happened eight minutes ago. Something to think about. Folks, have a great week. I'll see you on Thursday. Brian Barnett signing off.